where does that funding come from? Um, and this is all information that uh, is available online uh, on, on our webpage. Um, NDOT, you know, receives a, a lot of its funding from a, a number of different sources, um, with the majority of that being uh, from federal and state motor fuel taxes. And, and there's some numbers there. I don't need to read every last word on these on these screens, but that's a, a large portion of where our, our funding actually comes from um, is through um, fuel, fuel taxes, um, state and federal uh, wise. So uh, you wanted to talk about vegetation management and I do too, uh, and roadside vegetation as a whole. Um, and so I wanted to start out with some recent uh, happenings um, here um, with NDOT since I started. So I actually started uh, working for NDOT in 2017, in April 2017. And, and uh, when my predecessor, Bill Fielding, um, actually uh, retired at that time, he'd been working for NDOT, I think, at almost 40 years at that point, or, or maybe even just a hair longer at that at that point. And I'd worked with Bill um, when I was at Purdue University and uh, for uh, for a number of different things with regards to, to roadside vegetation management. But um, uh, one major component of that uh, that, w that we have is when I came in, I wanted to understand the system and, and what it was that were, were challenges within our, uh, our, our overall organization and, and, and when I got to to digging into the customer service cases, so we you know we have a pretty uh, broad customer service program, and, and um, we're able to to research a number of different things that's been streamlined even more here recently. And um, I was interested to find that that almost uh, you know a third of the customer service cases that come into NDOT are actually roadside related, um, and so. That just goes to show you, how, and just like the number of folks that are on the presentation tonight, um, that how many folks are, are very interested or very passionate about what's going on um, within the system. It's not just the roadway. It's not just traffic related items, um, but a lot, a big portion of that is actually roadside uh, type activities or, or type things. Um, this includes things like litter and debris, um, trees and vegetation, drainage is a big component of that as well as, as, as mowing. What do some of those customer service requests um, kind of sound like or, or look like when we're, we're looking at them? And, um, you know, I jokingly post this photo and say that this is what a lot of folks actually call in and say that they want. Um, you know, this very highly manicured location um, that's down the roadside that's that's clearly not a roadside. Uh, you know, this is going through the middle of a golf course. Um, and so this is you know, something that, um, you know, and so um, the so this is commonly what we, we hear from from the public in that it is something that that uh, that folks want to see this highly manicured thing. Um, and then there's the flip side of that where there's the needs that need to occur. Right. So there's something that needs to occur on the roadside from a vegetation management perspective um, that there's there's a problem. There's some kind of issue with sight if you're trying to see pull out of a driveway or or pull through a median. Um, there are some folks that really, really want um, stuff to be mowed. I look at this particular photo. I see a whole lot of, of cool season grass seed heads and um, you know this uh, pylon here uh, or, or delineator that's here, this yellow uh, piece in the background, that's about a three foot tall um, piece or four foot tall piece. And so you're able to see how tall that grass is. But um, historically, there's there's been kind of a demand that this grass needs to be mowed. I look at that as a vegetation manager and say that looks pretty good to me <laughs> and it probably doesn't need a lot of work. Um, but it is something that that folks do put out. And then on the flip side, you know, so we have folks that want a lot of of, of highly manicured things. We have uh, I, I can't say that it's an equal number, but it's a large number of folks that that would rather see native vegetation growing throughout the right of way. Um, and, and having flowers and having the, that that um, well kempt look, but in native vegetation, is definitely something that we do here, um, and it is something that that is definitely um, heard. And it's not the it's not the it's definitely not the majority, but it's not the minority either. So um, we do get a fair number of those those calls and things that come in. And, and yes, that is a photo from the state of Indiana. It's it's a little bit older based on some of the, the the vehicles that you might see in the background there, but it is indeed something that was taken in the state of Indiana. And then this is a photo that I actually took not too long ago. Uh, unfortunately, it's one of our native plants that are our grasses that are growing out in the median. This is over uh, in the Greenfield district. So the eastern part, uh, central, uh, central, central eastern part, part of the state over along US 40. Um, so this is, you know, a big blue stem in the in, in the photo here. And um, clearly that's a problem. Right. Um, and so 
there's there's some challenges with having some of these species depending on whether they're native regardless of whether they're native or non-native or uh, exotic invasive all of these things um the lights are turning off in here um all of these things do require some form of management and there's the right place for the right plant and i'm going to try to, to touch on that a number of times throughout here uh, as i move forward so um in dots vegetation management memorandum this is um, a piece that was put together in 2014 as a result of some research that had been put together um, by purdue university uh, at the time i was actually one of those researchers that was at purdue university and, and my lab was one of the work one of the group that was working on on, on a research project that um, tried to bring uh, science and, and and data behind uh, integrated vegetation management the utilization of multiple tools, uh, vegetation management tools to be able to replace some of the older protocols of, of constantly just mowing fence to fence or, or doing all of the same things the same way. Um, in that document, uh, as a result of that document in 2014, um, their statement that I have here is, is out of that memorandum um, that very explicitly states what it is that we are focused on trying to do from a vegetation management standpoint. And and really, uh, the bullet points are, are kind of what I want to draw attention to. And then really the last statement that I have there is that, um, you know, the principles above uh, must be held above all other considerations with safety being the most important. And I can't stress that enough that the primary focus of, of NDOT's vegetation management is for the purpose of safety of the motorist um, that are traveling down the highway and the interstate system that's that's out there. So um, we do have to to try to comply with state laws and regulations as it relates to a number of different uh, pieces, both from a vegetation management standpoint as well as a safety perspective. Um, we do try to manage vegetation to en enhance environmental protection and, and try to have a, a good control uh, of, of what it is that we're doing so that we're not negatively impacting the environment that's out there. Um, we need to mitigate erosion. That's a major, major challenge within the, the, right, uh, the roadside um, area because of the surface runoff that occurs from that paved surface that's out there. And then ultimately, um, you know, and this is a key point that I, I really do like to see, and, it's, and I'm happy that it's part of that, that uh, operations memorandum, is that we are focused uh, partly in, in trying to preserve and promote native habitat uh, along the roadside um and native flora uh, across the the state um but there is a perfect place for that and, and the right place for that and again I'll, I'll try to continue to touch on that as we move forward here so um 2014 to 2019 so um from the time that that operations memorandum was was put into place um until 2019 um, I'm, I'm kind of putting that together as kind of one bracketed piece, and, and there's a reason for that. I'll try to cover what occurred in 2019 uh, to try to be able to, to, to talk about a few uh, different things. So in 20, 2014, that operations memorandum was established, which m resulted in a major shift um, in our vegetation management practices across the state. It, it, it tried to streamline things and, and really put together a zonal approach. and uh, the diagram here or image here that I have tries to demonstrate some of that in, in that um, in 2014 that with the operations memorandum, we went away from the idea that um, everything within the right of way is is one one homogenous uh, treatment. And we uh, came to the point that um, the, the right of way should be broken into different management zones and those different management zones. Um, come with it a, a number of different pieces um, in terms of what it costs to maintain those things and then why we do what we do within that particular management zone. Um, the closer that we are to the road, the more, uh, the more intensive that management is, the further you get away from the road, um, you know, the, the less intensive that management is um, as right-of-way allows, of course. And so um, that's, that's a bit of a challenge with regards to right-of-way. Our interstate systems and, and U.S. routes um, commonly have a little bit more right of way than some of our state routes do, um, but you know some some uh, right of way may only be a few feet from the edge line uh, along the edge of the road. So, um, whereas other areas we may have uh, upwards of 500 feet from the edge of the road as part of the right of way, and so um, that's the intent of the or was the intent of the 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 operations memorandum for for vegetation management. Um, it did prescribe a less frequent mowing at that time. Um, so 
Uh, there were a number of different areas that were mowing four, five, and six cycles um, during a growing season um, in different parts of the state because they felt that that was something that was needed um, to, to keep the area looking nice. And then you drive down that same road, uh, you know, 30 or 40 miles, and you'd enter into a different district, and, and you would not see the same thing, the same practices going on uh, prior to that. But um, with the adoption of this uh, practice, it, it was something that tried to, to focus that in. It also identified um, the mowing widths. So this was the first major push to try to reduce the mowing widths that occurred within the right of way um, from a full width. Uh, pro, so from edge of pavement to the right of way boundary um, with every cycle. Uh, that was something that that was uh, was gone away from when we adopted the, the operations memorandum for that. Um, it also set the number of cycles. So the urban interstate uh, was set to three cycles. Um, and then other urban and interstate was set to three cycles at that time. And then other roads were generally set to two cycles with a, a prescribed mowing width of 30 and 15 feet, depending on which cycle you were on. Um, this also tried to change the timing of that, that mowing effort um, so that we were maximizing um, the, the efficacy of that um, control method. So mowing is done to shorten the height of the grass, right? And so if you mow that grass too early, uh, during the, the early part of the year, those seed heads will reform again on the cool season grass if you, if you, if you try to, to capture it too early on. And so um, that's the ideal time is to try to capture it once those, those grasses have actually uh, produced a, a seed head. Um, and so we can really get by with almost two cycles where we capture the cool season grasses in the, the spring and early summer. And then once again for the warm season vegetation in the, in the, the fall months. Uh, that was the intent, uh, and uh, I think for the most part, we were able to demonstrate a number of different savings associated with being able to do that. Um, this uh, operations memorandum also clearly defined the herbicide practices about what was expected and where it was expected. So based on zone, um, you know, what, what type of herbicide treatments should you do in the selective zone versus the natural zone? Um, and how to manage the different things of whether that would be trees or brush or, or noxious weeds, uh, invasive plants, and, it, and identified a lot of those different pieces, um, which was really important to um, draw attention to a lot of those things. Unfortunately, there was a lot of challenges faced with, with making this major change into um, that type of a, a very focused IVM program. And and I think first and foremost, one of the biggest things was limited resource and expertise for this new focus. And so not everybody's a, uh, an ecologist, not everybody's a vegetation management expert. And the same folks that we have out, uh, you know, uh, pushing snow and, and, and patching potholes are also being asked to do a lot of this same type work. Uh, and so that was a challenge that was observed during that time frame. And uh, things kind of moved through and, and, and evolved through time to be able to see some changes that I'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, invasive and noxious species that we have out there, noxious weed species, um, identifying those uh, different species um, can be the challenge even for, for somebody that's very um, educated in that process. Um, and um, again, asking somebody that's a, a, a jack of many trades to be able to do that on a, on a semi-regular basis can be a little bit challenging in, uh, in terms of training those folks and making sure that they're able to utilize that, that, that skill. Um, or, or train set. So the populations that existed across the state was also a challenge um, in terms of, of what was out there. And, and when we stopped mowing full width, we started to realize that we had a lot of populations of things that you didn't really notice before um, that were out there um, within, the, within the right of way. And all of a sudden those, those populations rapidly grew and, and, and caused some challenges with being able to, to control those things. And then ultimately, uh, probably the resource constraints that were, were probably the most trying was, was people, staffing, uh, the equipment needed to do some of this specialized equipment, and then ultimately dedicated funding for the materials associated uh, with, with that type of a, a treatment program. Um, as part of this, uh, there was some negative public response to the limited width mowing that I was talking about earlier um, uh, with regards to part of that program. Um, that's those customer service responses that I that I showed earlier that we, we did have a, a pretty large outcry associated with that. Um, we had a, a negative public response to the, to the delayed start time as well. So waiting and trying to, to maximize that that efficiency or that effectiveness of mowing was uh, was was viewed by many as a, a negative um, component to that. Um, 
And then ultimately from south to north, I, again, me working out of the central office location, I, I try to focus on having consistency across the state. So um, you shouldn't know as a motorist when you're traveling from east to west across the state that you're traveling across different borders uh, of management units. You should see the, really the same type of, a, of an application of the same policy. Um, and, and that's been a little bit of a challenge through time uh, until recently. So what's uh, I'll get to kind of what happened next. Another component of what was going on during that time frame and, and actually before um, was the Hoosier Roadside Heritage Program. In fact, I think that was one of the, the main reasons why I was in, invited to talk. And then I had to sadly say that the program, unfortunately, is has largely uh, fallen into a stale uh, patch for a number of different reasons. But it's, it's worth mentioning and talking a little bit about here um, for the, the sheer fact that um, this has uh, probably set some of the groundwork for, for what's occurring currently um, and where we are uh, both in the state as well as across the country um, for the need to, to try to have more native vegetation grown in the roadsides. Um, and uh, there was actually a grant set forth or, or applied for in the, the uh, 2000s early 2000s um, that, that actually provided some funding for uh, the purchase of, of no-till drills and seed sorters and uh, equipment to be able to put some things together, even a barn, uh, well, two, two uh, structures to be able to, to sort seed and do all this component. Um, at that time, uh, things were a lot different from a state government perspective. There was a very good um, uh, partnership between the Department of Corrections and NDOT at that time um, where NDOT was able to utilize Department of Corrections offenders to assist with some of that work, some of the low-level offenders and, uh, and even some of the high-level offenders in some locations um, were utilized as labor sources for some of that seed sorting. That's a, a, a labor of love and a labor of, of many hands <laughs> to be able to get just a little bit of seed if you ever get into that um, production from a commercial perspective to, to be able to produce enough to be able to go beyond just a, a small-scale planting. Um, there were uh, two seed sites that were permanently established, one in uh, Frankfort, Indiana, one in Winnemac, Indiana, and then a third actually was, was planted um, in 2015, if I remember right, um, down in Madison, Indiana, um, and unfortunately that one didn't get to the point where we had any kind of operational capacity um, before, before some things changed. Um, but there's a lot of, of time and, and, and resources needed to be able to make that program work. And unfortunately, um, over time, that, that program is kind of, again, kind of uh, stalled out and, and is currently kind of in a stale uh, status. So I did want to touch on that. that. That is and was something that occurred there. And, and some of the remnants from that, actually, um, uh, you can still see today. This is not all that old of a photo, just a few years old now. Um, along US 40, um, actually over in Putnam County, um, of some native vegetation that was actually planted uh, as part of the, the seed collection and planting practices that were being done during the, the early to mid um, uh, 2000 and 2010s um, through there. And so this is, uh, you still can go out and see these, these species growing in along a number of different locations in, along US 40 and, and 231 and even over uh, in 270, or, sorry, on I-70. Um, going towards the edge of the state. Another program that, that NDOT is involved with uh, as a partner of is the Corridors Program. Um, and this is a DNR program that is a uh, Department of Natural Resources program of uh, Division of Fish and Wildlife where uh, their biologists work with um, adjacent landowners to try to uh, provide some cost share uh, funding sources and, and technical expertise to be able to um, kind of partner up with NDOT uh, for, for projects that would ultimately plant some and foster uh, pollinator habitat along roadways and certain waterways. There's a number of different focus points that, that do get um, more attention than others in this particular case, but um, our interstate systems, those linear corridors um, are, are definitely something that, that can be uh, applied for and, and you can work with your uh, local biologist uh, to be able to talk through that. Um, NDOT does not provide any funding for this, but um, we do our best to, when we have new construction um, to be able to work with our, um, our partners with the DNR to be able to try to identify those adjacent landowners in an effort to see if they're interested in trying to plant some additional acreage um, beyond the, the fence or beyond the right-of-way boundary um, utilizing this program. 
So uh, I mentioned 2019 um, earlier, so that 2014 to 2019 component. Um, so what occurred in 2019 is um, I, I guess I, I, I pitched the idea to a number of different folks, uh, to including my, uh, my boss and his boss and his boss's boss. Um, so uh, the state highway maintenance director, the deputy commissioner of operations, and then ultimately the deputy or the commissioner of NDOT um, to be able to demonstrate um, kind of where we were and where we needed to go and how we're going to get there um, and the improvements that were necessary to our current systems. So um, in 2019, I, I made this pitch and, and um, walked through a lot of different discussions and, and tried to demonstrate what is being done in a number of different um, utility uh, rights of way and best management practices and, and rights of way vegetation management, um, not only here in Indiana, but across the country. Um, from a number of different uh, working groups that I'm involved with and 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 uh, both from the industry standpoint as well as from the Department of Transportation across the country. And um, we did want to maintain that zonal approach, but we tried to simplify things and and try to reduce the number of zones and and really, they're not much different. We have um, you know uh, the vegetation free zone, so within the paved surface um, and immediately adjacent to it, and then we move into the the mowing area, the clear zone, which is generally the first thirty feet from the edge of pavement. Um, the clear zone is a, a safety technique or, or, or uh, concept that is utilized um, to try to prevent errant vehicles from, from hitting obstructions and, and being able to see down the road um, to be able to um, drive safely without having any kind of problems. And then ultimately a selective zone beyond that space. So anything from 30 feet and beyond is really to be managed um, selectively. And so um, we're not going out with broad uh, cast applications. We're not going out full width mowing um, without uh, that being part of an overall plan um, and a purpose to be able to do that. So uh, generally speaking, in 2019, uh, we backed off the 30-foot mowing widths uh, as part of the cycles to a 15-foot mowing width um, on every road everywhere. Um, uh, with some exceptions uh, that include things like intersections where we actually have a taper that actually expands out from the road from that 15 feet and and tries to go uh, and to make sure that we have a good line of sight uh, sight triangle at that intersection and then I initially started we initially started with uh, medians less than 45 feet in width uh, to be um, mowed full width um, so you can imagine a 15 feet being mowed on each shoulder of that median and then uh, 30 feet or more being left in the middle. Well, folks, um, we got a lot of feedback from that and people didn't like seeing uh, the Mohawk down the median. Um, and so we, we moved that width uh, to a 60 foot in width, uh, kind of a, a width for full width mowing. Um, so anything greater than 60 feet in width will, uh, from a median perspective, will not be mowed um, uh, down, down the right of way. We um, made a major push to start to clear invasive um, woody vegetation um, and try to open those areas back up to her herbaceous cover. Um, herbaceous cover, uh, so uh, grass and, and broadleaf plants are definitely um, much uh, preferred over the woody vegetation um, in terms of how those, uh, that vegetation can be managed as we, as we drive down the road and, and, and be able to see uh, for our sight distance and everything else. So a big switch that also occurred in 2019 as part of this big push was that um, for the first time that I'm aware of, dedicated funding for roadside management was put into place, um, and it continues uh, to this date and, and hopefully uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, that roadside funding is, is focused towards mowing, woody vegetation, herbicide applications, um, and litter collection. Uh, litter collection makes up uh, about a third of that overall dedicated funding because we have a lot of litter that gets put out onto our roadsides, unfortunately. That's a whole nother presentation if you wanted to hear it sometime uh, about uh, the, the, the litter and the amount of litter that we have out there. So, um, so some more slides here, just going through things. So um, what you should expect to see out on the roadside uh, today, we have, you know, uh, most roads are on a two uh, cycle per year mowing cycle. Uh, 15 feet from the edge of pavement should be what's getting mowed. Nothing more than that, except for, you know, at intersections and some other very special um, type situations. We're trying to uh, focus that mowing. I've got all of this is set up on a contract basis now. Um, and so this is really trying to time and capture that seed head uh, maturity or maturation on the, the cool season grasses for the spring mowing and then 
the warm season grasses for the for the fall mowing. Um, as you well know, uh, I think as as uh, folks that are interested in the natural environment, Mother Nature throws us all kinds of curveballs, and so what may be the case this year may not be the case next year in terms of the perfect timing. Um, but we do our best to try to be able to to keep an eye on that and capture the ideal time uh, associated with it. Some other components of our program uh, include the mapping of noxious and invasive weed species um, within the right of way. Um, we, we had a little pilot project and by little, I mean, it was across the entire state in an effort to try to map 25 different species of noxious and invasive plants uh, growing within the right of way in a digital format um, so that we could understand the extent of the problem or problems, you know, 25 different species worth. And then so that we could ultimately kind of tabulate or, or, or calculate the number of acres that we have um, that are infested with um, these noxious and invasive species. Um, the intent of that is, you know, once you understand the problem, you're able to start to budget for things um, and understand what it takes and how, what kind of resources you need to be able to manage those different species. This is a screenshot uh, of that mapping project that that was un undertaken. Um, there was a number of challenges with that from a data perspective, but um, there was a, a good task and, and get to, to understand what it is that's out there. The intent for this is to be able to help direct um, control or treatment methods that are, are being employed out in the the across the, the, the right of way. So rather than trying to hunt and peck and find those particular populations, the the control effort could actually just be, you know, go straight to the spot and find that particular species and be able to do some applications. And then ultimately the goal is to be able to, from a long-term perspective, be able to understand if our vegetation management program is actually having any, you know, uh, any any benefit or, or or change or shift in that overall weed pressure or or uh, undesirable plants that are out there. Uh, mechanical biomass in 2019, we also purchased uh, six uh, Fecon um, brand in this particular case uh, forestry mulchers in an effort to be able to help us combat a lot of the woody vegetation, uh, especially the bush honeysuckle and autumn olive that uh, unfortunately in a lot of times was actually planted by NDOT uh, back in the 70s because everybody thought it was a great plant to, or great set of plants to be able to plant from a wildlife perspective. Um, turns out that was not such a good idea um, and, and causes a lot of problems. And so any area that we're not mowing now um, is very fast to get uh, inundated with uh, those two species as well as uh, as calorie pear um, as one of our probably our, our most troublesome uh, woody plants or at least I, we're starting to see that that's the case anyway. Um, some additional machines are being rented on an annual basis in an effort to try to help with these efforts to to, to mechanically reduce the, that woody vegetation um, and then we know that we have to be able to follow those those mechanical treatments up with uh, with an herbicidal control uh, as part of that. Um, herbicide applications as part of a of an IVM or integrated vegetation management program. So what that that um, operations memorandum really spelled out was was trying to to bring multiple different control methods or or, or maintenance methods into the system, and so um, we we are focused on doing annual broadleaf um, selective pro, uh, treatments on the clear zone. So I, again, I mentioned that first uh, 30 feet from the edge of uh, of pavement. Uh, as right of way allows, um, those areas are being treated for broadleaf weeds to include things like uh, Canada thistle and, and teasel and some of uh, uh, other uh, noxious or invasive species that grow along these areas. And, and that helps, um, you know, reduce the mowing needs ultimately. So uh, if we mow over those species, they, they typically come right back. Um, and uh, if we're if we're able to remove those from the system, then we can actually promote a, a healthy turf and reduce erosion and a number of other things. And then ultimately we we then try to focus beyond that for spot treatments on other noxious and invasive species um, where we're doing more of an individual plant treatment, very targeted approach to, to using herbicides. So we're not uh, just spreading, uh, spraying herbicides across the entire right of way. It's gonna be uh, as focused as we can to try to be able to do that. Um, from a seeding and revegetation perspective, I know that there's a lot of interest in this concept of, you know, why does NDOT not plant uh, native vegetation? Um, and uh, I'll touch on that a little bit here. But um, so for new construction, uh, the seeding that's implemented in those areas, uh, so say the I-69 uh, project uh, coming north now into uh, close towards Marion County, um, there's really five standard seed mixes that are utilized um, across the state 
Um, and those are predominantly cool season grass blends um, that are have been, for the most part, proven pretty uh, effective uh, to, to, for turf along the roadside within the state. Um, there's some components of that that uh, why we utilize cool season grasses for the most part. Um, I've been pushing very hard to try to get warm season grasses brought into that, some of our native grasses, um, because I think there's a place for a lot of those things uh, to be utilized. In fact, um, something that I will, I will say that I've recently started to observe is that there's a number of warm season grasses that have never been planted in, in dot right of way ever. Um, and they're actually making up one of our dominant grasses and, and that's rough drop seed. Um, and across a number of different locations uh, within the state where it may be a, an entire pure stand of that particular grass growing uh, in the right of way. So pretty exciting that that, that is occurring and, and uh, Mother Nature has its way of, of ensuring that we get those those native uh, vegetation back into to where it belongs. Um, for new construction, a designer has the option to include native vegetation. So um, this is something that's commonly being done on the back slope area. So from the ditch and beyond, uh, to the edge of right of way is a pretty common place where this is being implemented uh, as funds allow and depending on what the project is right so if we're doing a lot of earth disturbance uh, new road construction um, that that's commonly being utilized in those spaces but there are some challenges as it relates to um, uh, rule five or mpdes permitting um, as it relates to revegetation and, and some of those things are, are being worked on right now from a maintenance operations perspective, um, most of our earth disturbance is relatively small in, in, in scale. So we're talking about ditching or pipe replacement, um, relatively small areas. And so, and most of the time those are up in the clear zone where it makes a uh, pretty good sense to be able to revegetate that with, with cool season grasses um, from a management perspective. And Brooke, I think I'm doing okay time-wise here. I know that we were scheduled from a seven to eight, but um, I've just got a handful more slides, I think. So, um, so hold, hold with me here. Um, so recent happening, some things that's been discussed of, of recently is reviewing some of those standard specification mixes, uh, making sure that we have the right ratios and the right species being utilized, making sure that we're pulling out some of the, the non-native um, and exotic species like crown vetch. Um, we've pulled that out of the standard specifications. There hasn't been crown vetch planted on any construction project in probably more than 15 years to my knowledge, um, even though it may have been in the standard specifications, it was not something that was being utilized anywhere. Um, a lot of that's actually just seed in the seed bank when we have some of those uh, construction projects that are done within the right of way. Um, there's been some review of notice of termination requirements for um, the uh, use of, of native vegetation and what the requirements are to meet that 70% that requirement. Um, and I don't know, unfortunately, I don't know the exact uh, bit that's that's with that. And I'm getting some feedback from somebody who is unmuted, apparently. Barbara, I'm going to mute you, sorry. And um, and then ultimately, I've also been working with some of our neighboring partners, uh, our neighboring states in an effort to try to improve uh, seed availability by standardizing seed mixes across state DOT. So our partners in Ohio and Illinois and, and Michigan some in Kentucky um, had a lot of discussions with them in an effort to try to, to figure out a way to be able to make native seed more available at a, a much more uh, acceptable cost um, per acre to be able to be utilized. A couple of last points here before I, I open things up for some questions. Um, I, I would be remiss to say that we're, we're not uh, familiar with the, the, the plight of the monarch butterfly. If you're not familiar with that, um, you know, it's something that you, you, you probably, well, I imagine everybody is probably familiar with it in this group. So um, INDOT has actually uh, applied for the nationwide uh, CCAA, the Candidate Conservation Agreement with Assurances. Um, that's been submitted to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We're one of, uh, I think, 30 or so different organizations that have made that application. Um, and that application is a legally binding agreement that says that we're going to manage our right-of-way um, in a manner that is uh, beneficial to the monarch butterfly. Um, and that would be following pretty consistently with, with what's within the operations memorandum and how we're currently managing um, that application has not yet been uh, approved by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It, it's under review currently. Um, so you heard it here first um, that <laughs> that is something that, that NDOT is undertaking. And um, I have this slide up. This, uh, if you want to grab a screenshot or jot this down, 
um, rightofway.erc.uic.edu, or you can just uh, use your search um, tool uh, on, on the internet and search uh, National Monarch CCAA, and you're probably going to come up with some details about that if you're interested in understanding what um, transportation and energy um, companies are doing um, voluntarily to, uh, to be able to help the monarch butterfly. Uh, this is a, a very large undertaking and, and nothing remotely like it has occurred to date um, in terms of endangered species um, uh, protection and, 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 and help. A couple of final points here. Um, there's a song, uh, and I'm not a singer, so I'm not going to try uh, to, to, to sing the song, but uh, it goes along the lines of sign, sign, everywhere a sign. Um, and, and I wanted to, to bring this out uh, and call this to, to attention to this group um, because I know that there's a lot of real passionate individuals that are here. And, you know, and, and when we see these signs out in the right of way, uh, you know, if they're placed by NDOT, um, there's generally a reason for that sign to be placed. But when we have landowners that place them, we're not really sure why those signs are placed. And um, I'm going to come to a reason why that that can be challenging as a, a manager of that particular stuff. And and there's a number of different things that are out there. We see all sorts of different things. This is even a sign that we put together. And I do want to call attention to, though, the idea of, of what these signs actually imply and then how they're utilized within the right of way in terms of, of conveying that same message, right? Um, in terms of where they're placed to be able to clearly call out what that, that, object, uh, that object is that we're trying to protect. Um, and then Ultimately, and this is just some food for thought to talk about, uh, possibly bring up some uh, some questions here. But, you know, when we put these kinds of things out there into our natural environment, well, uh, our engineered environment, that's not so natural anymore. What occurs um, without disturbance? So if we take out all mowing and spraying from the engineered environment, what what is what is expected to occur within that? Uh, within that space? And that may not be just in the right of way. It may be in other areas. And, and I'll show a slide or two. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Hopefully you're able to see that sign that's in the middle there. And then for anybody that's a, a plant identification guru, you're going to see that that is um, Canada thistle growing um, and surrounding that particular do not mow or spray sign. And so um, in the perfect world, um, the folks would see that and say, oh, that's Canada thistle. It needs to be controlled. Um, but unfortunately, that big black and white sign that's in the middle of that um, very clearly tells everybody to stay out, stay away, don't come near me with your mower or your sprayer because it says that I'm not supposed to mow or spray that. And so um, that, that poses some challenges. And I got another example of that here. Um, this is down in southern Indiana somewhere, and I can't remember now exactly where it was. Um, but there was a, a mitigation area that was planted with some native vegetation within there. And uh, unfortunately, this is not native vegetation that's growing here. This is a bunch of teasel and a bunch of crown vetch that's growing in behind a sign that's placed just up the hill right up, up here uh, to the left side of the screen. And so, unfortunately, those signs, while they have good meaning, um, sometimes can have very uh, uh, negative effects um, within uh, that environment. So, um, if I have a preference, I would rather, much rather, see something like this being utilized, where it actually says, you know, what it is that you're trying to intend to do, um, identifying what it is that you're trying to protect, and then understanding that uh, there's going to be some, um, you know, some management of that space moving forward. So some final and closing thoughts, and then we can take some questions. I, I don't know how many have come into the chat. I haven't been trying to monitor that as we as I've talked through here, but um, so NDOT's uh, current vegetation management practices are to control the bad plants as best we can with the resources that we have. And while doing so, we're trying to promote the good plants that are out there. And so um, knowing that there are spaces within the a close proximity to the roadway, that's gonna be very intensively managed because it needs to be from a site distance and from a safety perspective. But beyond that space, we're able to start to promote and, and really uh, focus on allowing those species and planting those species in those areas. Um, I urge you as, as, as passionate folks within uh, this world to, to continue to work locally and promote and request native vegetation um, and reduced uh, maintenance regimes. Uh, I drive by a couple of locations in central Indiana that just drive me crazy because it's lawn mowed every week. Uh, or more, um, and I think there's a lot of different ways that we could utilize some of that space and, and have it be good uh, pollinator habitat and, and native vegetation that's growing out there. 
uh, understand that there's uh, the right place for for the right plants. Um, you know, trees really don't belong within a certain distance of the roadside. I love trees and I want to plant as many trees as I can. And, and we do plant trees and we have planted trees both for NDOT and, and me personally. Um, uh, but the roadside is one of those challenging places that that can be, be can be pretty challenging. Um, and then lastly, I, I urge you to get active in your local cooperative invasive species management area or CISMA. Um, the uh, invasive uh, Indiana Invasives Initiative, the III, is something that I encourage you to look into if you're not familiar with it. Um, I, I serve on the Indiana Invasive Species Council's, uh, the Indiana Invasive Species Council, and um, this is a, a major movement that's going on in, in this grassroots effort uh, of the CISMAs. Uh, I'm very impressed with, and, and it's it's gaining traction and it's gaining ground, and uh, I love to see the efforts that are occurring within that. And so, um, with that, I'm going to stop um, talking uh, nonstop and be able to hopefully take some questions. Brooke, I'm going to let you try to moderate that, or perhaps you can ask me questions that have been entered into the chat if there's any questions at this time. Yes, thank you, Matt. That was great. I have been um, copying questions throughout the presentation, and um, so I have them all here in a document. If I come across questions that I think were already addressed, I'll skip over those. Um, and okay. then, um, yeah, if you have more questions, keep them coming. And uh, when yeah. I get to the end of this list, we'll uh, revisit that chat. So um, we were recording this, but somebody asked if you would be able to share the PowerPoint later on. Uh, do they, if they need it beyond being uh, recorded, then I could probably do that, sure. Okay, um, we'll find out. <clears throat> so uh, somebody else asked, why is the blue, big blue stem a problem? And is it the height issue? I believe that had to do with visibility. Yeah, so uh, I don't know if I need to scroll back through that particular to that slide, but um, I can talk through that concept. So that big blue stem was grown in the median of I-40, or sorry, of uh, US-40. Um, and in that particular instance, um, that was kind of, I took that photo between mowing cycles. Um, and so that road was is scheduled to only have two mowing cycles. And so there's a mowing that occurs in roughly the June time frame, and then there's a cycle that occurs roughly uh, in September. Uh, middle of September and so that big blue stem had matured prior to that mowing cycle and um, you know in or had produced its seed head and so in that particular instance um, I, I have another series of photos that are associated with that and Catherine is somebody is sharing their screen now I'm not sure who's sharing their screen uh oh sorry sure how that happened. <laughs> so um, so in that particular case with that big blue stem, I have some photos that actually as you were, if you were trying to pull through that intersection, um, what you would run into is that you would have to, your vehicle would have to be in the lane of travel before you could see down the road to be able to safely cross that, that, that particular um, roadway. And so that's why that big blue stem would be a challenge or, or a negative thing in that particular instance. Okay, I thought that was the answer. So um, let's see, somebody asked, do you try to eliminate invasives? Well, you did cover that already. Um, somebody else asked, would shrubs between lanes in the median actually enhance nighttime safety as newer headlights are blinding to oncoming vehicles? Is somebody sharing their screen again? They are. I'm going to go ahead and put my screen back up, um, and that way it'll be <laughs> it'll be mine with the the caterpillar instead of somebody else being able to share theirs. So, um, so visual screening, um, utilizing shrubs and other vegetation in the median is um, a practice that was employed uh, in the 80s and 90s that I'm familiar with, and is still done to a limited uh, extent in some locations across the country. It is not something that we are currently, we in dot are currently utilizing um, as a safety measure uh, to try to reduce headlight glare um, from the interstate uh, system. Um, there are a few instances where that may be useful, um, but some of the challenges with man managing that vegetation um, and the safety aspect of that vegetation being in the median can also cause pose its own problems. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody asked, what is preventing the success of the seed program? You talked about um, the seed program that you were working on with corrections. Yeah, so 
um, the, the, probably the biggest thing that's preventing the success of that is, um, labor. <laughs> um, so we, we were utilizing, uh, for the seed farm a, a, in Frankfurt, and this was actually before my time. Um, but the, the seed farm in Frankfurt at the, the Frankfurt subdistrict there, um, there was, I think, I want to say it was something like eight acres worth of seed, uh, the 40 different species that were planted in a, uh, a nursery type of a setting. There was irrigation that was there. And then so ultimately you would have to, to go out and, and tend that, maintain that, um, harvest the seed, dr uh, sort the seed, dry the seed, and then be able to package that back up. And so all that takes a lot of, a lot of, uh, of manpower. And um, I would say that um, uh, with the Department of Corrections, that is a partnership that's no longer in place. Um, the Department of Corrections um, suggested that they had other priorities besides working on that particular program uh, across the state. And um, so NDOT has not had the staff to be able to dedicate uh, resources to be able to produce our own seed uh, from a cost effective manner. Okay. So when people complain about not enough mowing, is there an attempt made to educate them about your purpose? Absolutely, there's a, 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 a the ability, <laughs> and I would love to help have the assistance in, in uh, being able to educate folks um, on uh, the uh, reason for mowing and the, 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 the method for mowing behind it. And, and we do have a website that's available for that, um, that we, we try to explain that zonal approach like I tried to talk through today. Um, to be able to demonstrate what it is that we do and why it is that we do that. Um, and uh, I will say that having been part of many uh, phone call um, with a concerned um, citizen, that uh, some folks just don't, they have their own opinion on how, on how it should be managed. So, Right, okay. Um, next question is, was the invasive bird's foot trefoil um, and crown vetch intentionally planted along the recently completed I-69 construction. The, neither of those two species were actually in the seed mix um, that was utilized in any of those locations. And, and I think I thought I'd address that to, to an extent. But um, so both of those seeds, unfortunately, uh, live a very, very long time in the soil. Um, and so any type of topsoil that, that may be brought in um, or maybe is borrowed and utilized within the, the same construction site is going to have those particular species within that particular area. And one, uh, unfortunately, one crop of, of seed from either of those two species um, can have a lasting effect within the right of way. Uh, I don't remember the number of seeds that are produced by a, a, a yellow or white sweet clover, um, but it's hundreds um per plant and uh you know one year goes by and those those seeds those plants produce seeds and those seeds are going to be in that seed uh bank for for a long time oh boy okay yeah. <laughs> next, trust me i i don't like them either <laughs> yep yep, uh, yep um next question would seeding with warm season native grasses and right of way be a potential compromise that NDOT might adopt instead of using you might have already covered this, but let me finish it. The root systems would be extremely beneficial to stormwater management and help to exclude invasive plants. And controlled burns could be used as an alternative to some mowings. Yeah, so um, uh, that's a two-part two part question that I could touch on. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough time to be able to show some of the photos from the uh, early 90s where NDOT actually used prescribed fire as a vegetation management technique within the right-of-way. Um, that was sh stopped shortly after that because of a few accidents um, and some litigation and lawsuits that were associated with that. So um, unfortunately, we're probably not going to bring um, prescribed fire back into the management uh, toolbox for NDOT. Um, I would love to be able to implement that. And I think there's a lot of places where that would be a, a perfect tool to use. I, I commonly see um, fires that escape for one reason or another that are in the right of way. And I, I kind of uh, give a little cheer as I drive by because I love what I see when that vegetation has actually been burned um, because we, I see a lot of benefit from that and it's a, it's a natural process. As it relates to native vegetation in seed mixes, I, I did address that. I just kind of brushed on it. Um, there, are, uh, there are a number of seed mixes that are available to our maintenance staff. So I've got, uh, I think there's six six different uh, seed mixes that ha are native uh, vegetation specific. 
um, that our maintenance staff are able to, to purchase through a quantity purchase agreement um, and be able to utilize. And, and there are a number of locations that do uh, purchase some of that seed uh, t tends to maybe 100 acres a year kind of a thing, um, not thousands of acres. But we also don't do that much uh, disturbance. Um, and then from new construction project, when it comes to seeding, again, I think the, the designers are, are going to focus because of the guidance that's that's been provided to them um, in that clear zone. So the four slopes down to the bottom of the ditch generally um, from the edge of pavement is going to be utilized with cool season grasses um, just because of the cost associated with that. Um, it, it's rather cheap, relative, relatively cheap and easy to establish. Um, it doesn't take specialty equipment to be able to plant that stuff. And it doesn't, you know, you don't have to wait a number of years for that vegetation to grow and, and establish. Um, and there are some major benefits to utilizing native vegetation. I've planted a lot of native vegetation along the roadsides, both when I was at Purdue and uh, since. And um, uh, it can be a challenge to get some of the native grasses and some of the native vegetation to establish. I know one stretch outside of Frankfurt that I planted in 2012, it was um, uh, four years before it actually started to get to the point where we had more than 50% cover in that particular area, which can be rather challenging when you're trying to focus on trying to reduce uh, soil erosion. Um, not impossible, but uh, we've also looked at a number of other grasses, um, native grasses that, that can be utilized. Unfortunately, the, the, the availability of a lot of that seed is, is pretty sparse um, and uh, can be pretty expensive to try to implement on a, a broad scale. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Sorry, I just lost my place. Okay, um, are you able to comment on the proposed uh, Senate Bill 389 legislation to remove wetland protections and as such the potential impacts on NDOT infrastructure? I am not able to comment on it and I don't know much about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, next question. I see a lot of rectangular riprap areas on grassy slopes, often gently sloped areas adjacent to highways. What is the purpose? Because there's no indication of erosion that I can see. Brooke, can you re re repeat the first part of that question? I was smiling and thinking about how much I love riprap. <laughs> so um, this person sees a lot of it on grassy slopes that are not their gently sloped areas often. Um, right adjacent to the highways with so there's no indication of erosion that this person can see what is the purpose of that placement of a riprap so i'm going to guess that the the placement of that riprap is probably for uh, managing or, or or in response to erosion uh, that may have occurred at some point in time whether that be through uh, recent efforts from new construction or if it's something that occurred a, a long time ago um, there are a number of locations where riprap is is utilized, uh, especially at the edges of bridges or the ends of bridges where we have a lot of water that flows into those particular areas and is trying to flow off of that bridge um, and trying to find its first outlet out. Um, I am uh, a, I'm not a huge fan of riprap. Uh, I'm not an engineer and I'm not the one that specs a lot of that stuff when it comes to a design thing. Um, I think there's a number of different tools that we can utilize that are much more uh, appealing to the eye as well as uh, effective in terms of trying to control that erosion that's out there. Um, I, I'll stop there. Okay, Matt, I, I guess I have a follow-up question to that one. Sure, is sure. it ever the case that um, the riprap is incrementally removed and replaced with vegetation that you know of? That I'm aware of. Uh, so, aggregate or stone is utilized in some instances for the purposes of erosion control uh, as a temporary measure. So it may be part of a, uh, a filtering system that may be going down through the, you know, a ditch line, for instance, as a, as a sediment catch. Um, so that riprap would potentially be removed. Um, and that's, I don't think that's what you're asking for there, Brooke. But um, I have seen on some, some specifications in a few locations, uh, actually on I-69 project, and I can't remember which section it is now, but um, where um, some riprap was placed, but native um, vegetation was actually then seeded into that riprap area with the intent that that native vegetation would grow up and through um, and, and be within that particular spot. So we would kind of have the dual benefit of those um, native grasses with their large root systems that dig very, very deep into the soil, as well as having that surface protection because of the slope structure that was there. I see similar instances where willows were used and um, 
um, red fig dogwood and, and the such. That would be interesting to see if more of that could happen. Um, next question, are there efforts to manage common reed infestation along NDOT right of way? Great question. I didn't get into the meat and the potatoes of the herbicide program. So common reed, um, I'm, I'm assuming that you're referring to uh, Phragmites australis uh, in that particular instance. Um, and so um, as part of that herbicide, uh, as part of our herbicide program, uh, every district, so the six districts, all have a thousand acres of, of contracted uh, applications dedicated to um, uh, Phragmites or, or common reed and or cattails. Um, and, and both of those species are, are challenges to our drainage ways. Um, you know, uh, there is no state requirement that, that, that requires us to control Phragmites, um, but it is something that we do, do see that is a problem and, and in the northern half of the state or northern, well, it's really everywhere. It's not just the northern half of the state, but um, Phragmites is very common in, in the northwestern portion of the state. Um, and, and we do have a lot of acres up there along 65 and 90 uh, and a, a number of other locations. And um, so hopefully over the last couple of years since 2019, you've been seeing some of the control efforts on uh, those particular species. Um, if there are, and I guess maybe I should have mentioned this earlier on, um, if you, uh, the folks that are on the, the call here, if you guys come across populations of, of particular invasive species, you know, I, I do urge you to um, utilize some of the reporting tools. Um, Ed Maps uh, is one that you can report those particular species on. And you also have the ability to, and I should have put this probably or could put it into our, our chat box or, or we can follow up maybe with another email. Um, we have uh, NDOT's customer service portal, um, report a concern um, portal. It's uh, www.ndot4u.com. Um, you are able to uh, submit a, a, a complaint or a concern. Um, and if you have a population of, of uh, some really troubling species that's out there, uh, a patch of kudzu or, um, you know, a common reed that's growing in the ditch line in front and, and it's something that, you know, you observe that that, that is a problem, uh, feel free to submit those requests because all of those customer service um, concerns are reviewed and looked at and then ultimately dispatched out to the appropriate location if the, the right information is provided with it. Um, and then ultimately the, the, the maintenance team is tasked with trying to, to come up with a, a plan to be able to, to manage those populations. Great, thank you. Next question, is your roadside herbicide application done by staff or contractors and how do you handle education to help them understand what plants to apply to? Yeah, so uh, great question. Uh, historically, uh, we were we, we relied on our uh, in, internal staff to, to make a lot of those applications. Um, and uh, the 2014 to 2019 timeframe, on average, we were applying something like uh, 40,000 acres, uh, applying to 40,000 acres a year. Um, since 2019, uh, when we adopted the contracted application process, uh, greater than 95% of our herbicide applications are being done by contractors. Um, those contractors are licensed applicators within the state, uh, and many of which are, are, are licensed in, in a multitude of states. Um, and the education associated with that, uh, some of that comes with the contract specifications as to what, what we're asking them to do um, and, and where, what materials to use and when to apply. Um, but ultimately, they, as the applicator, are required by state law to read and follow the, the herbicide label um, to include uh, not applying off target. And, and that is something that, that we do, um, we, we take pretty seriously, and, and we've had a lot of discussions with, with them on. Um, I, I don't know that I'm necessarily aware of too many major issues where they're uh, applying areas that they shouldn't based on the specifications um, that we have put forth with them. Um, but if there is something that needs to be brought to our attention, again, that that report of concern uh, or, or customer service portal would be a good place to be able to, to submit those, those concerns. OK, thank you. Um, not sure if you can address the next question. Um, we uh, sometimes get people from adjacent states joining us. Um, so this person asks, how do I find out what my state is doing and who the contact people are? That comes from Andrea. I don't know if she's still on here. Um, I assume she should go to her state's Department of Transportation. Yeah, so um, yeah, I'm not sure which state she's in. I probably have a contact information for, for her state probably. 
um, because I do work with my peers across the the, the neighboring states. Um, And I guess maybe I didn't really clarify that from the very beginning. Um, So NDOT uh, is responsible for state highways, U.S. routes, and interstate. Um, So NDOT is not responsible for the county road system. Um, or any of the municipality roads roadways within uh, within the state. Those are are managed by local or different agencies or entities. So um, sometimes there's some confusion with the, the the public as to who's whose responsibility the different roadways are. Um, if that if Andrea wants to to email me, I think Brooke, you were going to make my email available. Um, uh, you know, I'd be happy to try to put her in contact with the right folks. Okay, it looks like she's from New York State. So not New a- York State. I was just on a call with uh, with somebody from New York this morning, and I'm trying to remember her name. Actually, uh, she's my position over there, and I and I, her name's escaping me for some reason. What a coincidence! Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. So yes, I'll be sharing your email, and you two can connect. Um, let's see. The next was not a question, but it was a comment that I thought it was important to include in case not everybody saw the chat. Um, I think it was Sarah who said it is important that we contact NDOT and say that we appreciate the planting of native plants on our roadsides. That's, um, that's a great point. I'm giving it two thumbs up. Um, <laughs> so I, I didn't put that in my final thoughts. Anything that um, your group and the, the, the folks that are online here can do to um, you know, really indicate to uh, NDOT how how important native vegetation and reduced mowing and habitat creation um, uh, is not only to NDOT, but also, uh, and, and I probably have to be careful here, but um, with your state legislators, if that's something that you're interested in and trying to see, um, make sure that your voice is heard um, because there's a lot of other voices that are also being heard, so. That's a great point, Matt, thank you. Um, Yes, I think always contacting your legislators. Um, and you might have addressed the next question. I'm sorry, that a lot of this evening I've been cutting and pasting manically, so I missed some of the presentation. Um, I noticed teasel in the drainage ditch planting. This is on Top Street North of Route 30 in Merrillville. How is that managed so it won't become a problem? Can it be mowed before it goes to seed? Did you talk about that with this already or? So I, I didn't necessarily address that completely. So um, so again, I, I'm going to bring back the idea of the uh, the spot treatment part of our herbicide program. So uh, in addition to that thousand acres that we have dedicated to uh, common reed or, or phragmites and, and cattails uh, per district, we also have a thousand acres um, dedicated uh, or maybe just a hair more. I think it's a thousand acres to in every district um, for uh, Canada thistle or teasel species. Um, and so on an annual basis, there is more than 6,000 acres of, of teasel and or Canada thistle being treated across the state through that program um, and, and as part of that program. In terms of the ideal mowing, uh, you know, the mowing process for teasel prior to it producing seed, um, unfortunately, there's been some research that's been done for teasel that um, you can mow teasel uh, about a dozen times and it'll still produce a flower. Um, and it'll still produce seeds. Uh, it'll just be uh, six inches tall or however tall you have that mower set to. Um, and so that, that's a, unfortunate for us, um, but it, it is a, something that realistically, teasel is relatively easy to remove from the system. It just takes a couple of years worth of treatments in that same space. The seed is not very long lived in the seed bank. Um, and so if there's a, an isolated population of it, it is relatively easy to be able to remove from that system. Well, that's good news yeah it's a a good plus (laughs) Matt that that was my question but how do you treat just the teasel without treating everything else that's in there and I see what looks like phragmites but I've never looked I've never looked carefully enough to see if it was the native or the other one yeah so so Lynn that uh, great questions there so um, when it comes to our herbicide program um, for the most part more than 90% of our applications are utilizing selective uh, chemistries, so selective herbicides. So what I mean by that is the herbicides that we're utilizing, it's not a non-selective chemistry. And again, I I actually teach some courses on this, um, (laughs) herbicide method or uh, modes of action and the like. But um, so the chemistries that we use are only going to control the the broadleaf uh, species um, that are within that particular spot. And we ideally try to make that treatment as in as small an area as possible. So if we have a, a, a clump of 
of, of teasel growing in that particular area. If there's some milkweeds growing in there with it, unfortunately, the milkweeds are probably also going to get dinged up um, by that chemistry that's being utilized in that particular spot. And, and unfortunately, I'm a horticulturist. I have some, I, sure. you know, there's a lot of stuff I don't know, especially for commercial use. But everything that's in there, I think, pretty much is... Um, Problem bad yeah <laughs> so, there's a lot yeah. of broadleaf i mean i didn't even know what teasel was until i saw it sticking out <laughs> above everything else and started checking i, I don't know and then and then uh, you, you hit on another point too um in in that the uh, native versus the uh, invasive uh, common reed species um unfortunately we are not going to the depths of trying to identify the difference between the two species you know the two different species um in terms of what's the good and what's the bad um, within the right of way, uh, there's that that's kind of taking it to the very next level, and I'm not sure that we're ever going to be able to get to that level of, yeah. of expertise. I guess I was I was thinking more of the teasel. Sure. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. No, you're okay. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Hey, Matt, I've got a technical question for you. Okay. <laughs> in the in the calendar for teams, when I scheduled this, I scheduled it till eight thirty. It'll keep going if we go a little past eight thirty, right? It will go until you shut it down. Excellent. That's what I wanted to hear. Yep. Okay. Thank you. We have just a few more questions here. Um, <clears throat> next one. Please discuss long term management of young native forests that have arisen along the very wide right of ways along I sixty four. So I'm not sure if I'm getting trapped here um, <laughs> with regards to if they, the, the person asking the question is, uh, likes the forest that are growing there or dislikes the forest that are growing there? Um, it's, not a, it's not a trap. I'm really am asking what the <laughs> long-term management will be. Thank sure, you. Sure. Uh, and so the, by and large, I mentioned and, and showed that, that – um, uh, zonal approach that we have there uh, in, in, across all right of way. And so ultimately the goal is to try to have um, the native vegetation that, you know, is, is supposed to grow in an area to grow in an area. Um, and so, um, you know, those spaces that are, are a long distance away from the roadside, so greater than 80 feet um, from the road edge, uh, those areas can realistically probably be allowed to grow back into woody vegetation um into the native woody vegetation that's growing there obviously we have some challenges with what what does ultimately want to seed in there so we have the calorie pear and, and bush honeysuckle autumn olive and some of the other um, bad actors that we have from a woody vegetation perspective but um from a native perspective i don't see that there's too much of a challenge with some of those areas actually growing back in um uh, to allow some of that stuff to go in and and there are some people that have different opinions in that regard uh, because it's right of way and what the right of way is uh, originally purchased for and what it can be used for in the future. Um, and ultimately, those areas may end up being cleared long term. Um, but um, from a vegetation management perspective, in terms of how we're our maintenance team is, you know, maintenance operations is, is focusing our efforts, um, those spaces that are, you know, 80 feet or, or 100 feet away from the road edge. Are not going to get a lot of woody uh, species control in, in most areas. I hope that answered your question, Ray. Yes, thank you. That's fine. Thanks, Matt. Uh, next question Queen Anne's lace also seems to be quite common. Is it difficult to control? Wild carrot, uh, Dacus carota. Um, so it, it's. Uh, not impossible to control, um, and so hopefully you're not seeing a lot of that uh, that species growing within um, the first 30 feet of the roadside because those uh, broadleaf weed control applications that we are making on an annual basis should be controlling that species as well as chicory, which is another pretty common problem species that we have growing in the roadside. That both of those things, if you mow them off, they just you know they they pop back right back up again. Um, and become, you know, a nuisance in that regard and produce flowers and seeds and, and the like. And so it does take some time, unfortunately, to, to remove that, those seeds from the seed bank. Um, but I would say that uh, since 2014, not, believe it or not, even though I was spending some time in Kansas when I worked out there, uh, I did spend some time back here. And I would say that since some, our herbicide program has been uh, underway, uh, you know, again, started back in 2014 pretty reg regularly, those species populations like Canada or like uh, wild carrot and, and chicory have largely gone down in population size, at least in the first 30 feet. Beyond that space, 
we're not doing broadleaf, you know, uh, control broad scale to, to try to control species like that. And long term, I would expect that many of those species would actually probably work their way out of the system. OK, great. Um, how do you think the corridors program could be improved on or expanded upon? Um, that's a great question, and I don't know that I have a great answer for it, um, to be honest with you. Um, I, I, I have been working with our, uh, our biologists when the opportunity arises. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm one person across the entire state. <laughs> there's, there's no other mats uh, working within the other districts or the like as of right now. And so uh, they're also taxed within the, the Division of, of, of Fish and Wildlife uh, in terms of what they're tasked with. And so um, right now there's not dedicated funding for that program. It's a, a, you know, kind of a partnership from a couple of different groups. And, you know, the, there's some funding that's available for adjacent landowners. And um, I think the some of the ways to try to make that improve would be, um, you know, working, encouraging folks to work closely with the biologists to try to get those those areas identified um, and then ultimately start to plant. And then there's some signs available for that kind of work, which also helps promote, you know, the, the program itself. Uh, I guess that a lot of folks have no idea that it even existed prior to, to hearing me even mention it today. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks. Um, well, I don't see any more questions in the chat. There was one last comment I wanted to share uh, from Mary because I agree with it so much. She says she's uh, she's so thankful you are with NDOT. Based on your background and dedication to invasive plant management and native planting when possible, so many challenges are on your plates. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, oh, okay. One last question. Would you please share again where to comment to NDOT to encourage the pollinator planting? Yeah, so uh, I, if I remember the email address correctly, it's um, uh, www.ndot.com. I so that would be I N D O T, the number four, the letter U, dot com. Um, so report a concern, uh, make a request. There's a number of different things that are here um, to be able to put uh, ways to be able to put in. There's also a, the option of being able to um, uh, call the same number. So that N dot four U that I was talking about earlier, you should see down here at the bottom part of your screen. So I N D O T for you.com um, should take you to this page but also you can call in 855 for you um, and this is going to get you if you call that in you're going to get a, a live operator um, literally 24 hours a day um, I've, I've used it myself to be able to call in and report something that was you know a hazard on the roadway or something like that this is a, a great tool to be able to use and if you don't have that number saved in your phone i highly encourage it Okay, I think this is the last question. Sure. Uh, Nikki um, says that she really liked the sign about let it grow. Kurt, do you know where she can get one? Uh, I, I pulled that image from the internet, so unfortunately I, I don't know where where that's something that, that can be okay. done. But I've actually seen some similar signage um, utilized in uh, Lafayette, Indiana, actually with some uh, native plantings that were planted uh, along a roadway up there that said something along the lines of you know uh, native vegetation planting let it grow uh, kind of a thing but again I, I caution placement of those things and understanding that uh, we need to be able to communicate the message that you know those areas do need management it's it's not a it's not a no management type of a system because we do have these invasive species it's you know it's no longer a, a natural environment so we do have require some form of management to occur in virtually every environment so Okay, Matt, thank you so much. This has been a great wealth of information here tonight. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. I, I appreciate the invitation and um, I'm sorry if I, I, I glazed over something or didn't cover something to, to, to the interest of the, of the group. Um, I, I regularly give presentations on a number of different topics from pollinator habitat to vegetation management, um, and there's only so much you can fit into an hour presentation. So I hope I didn't go too long over. No, I, I think you did a great job. We really appreciate it. You're getting a lot of accolades in the chat. I hope you can see that. I, I haven't checked those, but I, 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 I'll have to look through them here before. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank have you.